The next uh, speaker, which is uh, Jim Kirkland. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining. And we have an audience here eager to hear what you have to say and uh, also an online uh, audience. And we're very thrilled to have you here today. Whenever you're ready, you can uh, share your screen and uh, begin your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex, Danielle, and Morton. Um, I wish I could have been there in person, but Mayo travel policy um, stopped me from uh, attending. Uh, Copenhagen is one of my favorite cities. Uh, I'm going to speak about seller senescence and senolytics, and Laura Niederhofer, a very close collaborator, is going to follow me and discuss um, how uh, senolytics may and senescence may impact on infection and inflammation. So I think as everyone in the audience is aware, fundamental aging processes appear to be root cause contributors to the geriatric syndromes, that's things like age-related muscle impairment or sarcopenia, immobility, malcognitive impairment, as well as most of the major chronic diseases and uh, decreased physical resilience, that is decreased um, ability to, re to recover after surgery or with an infection. Um, age is by far the biggest predictor of uh, multiple chronic diseases. For example, the relative risk of having a heart attack or stroke is increased two to fourfold by having a positive family history, a high blood sugar, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol. But if you're 85 as opposed to 30, your relative risk of having a heart attack or stroke is increased 1,000 fold. And the same tends to be true of the other major diseases. So aging is by far and away the largest risk factor, as it were. And it's looking increasingly like fundamental aging mechanisms may drive these. You can divide these so-called pillars of aging into anywhere from four to 13 categories, but they're all interlinked in something that we call the unitary theory of fundamental aging mechanisms. And that's that if you target one of them, you tend to affect the rest. So I like to think simply of, um, in terms of categories of fundamental aging processes, one being inflammation, that's usually chronic, low-grade, and sterile, that is in the absence of known bacteria and fungi and associated with fibrosis, macromolecular and organelle dysfunction, which you've heard about and will be hearing a lot about, stem and progenitor cell dysfunction, I believe the talk just before me um, went into that, and cellular senescence, which I'm going to focus on. So senescence is a cell fate, much like replication, differentiation, apoptosis, or necrosis. It does take longer than other cell fates to become established, and this becomes important when we talk about treatment regimens later. So at least in vitro, it takes anywhere from a week to six weeks for a cell to become fully senescent. There are at least 40 or 50 different things which can tend to push a cell to the, into the senescent cell fate. These are generally damage-related kinds of signals. Um, including things like um, uh, detection of oncogenes, uh, DNA damage within cells, uh, repeated replication, proteotoxic stress, uh, problems with um, uh, metabolic milieu. Uh, mechanical stress can do it, and this seems to be part of the mechanism of development of senescent cells in osteoarthritis and along blood vessels. Uh, and inflammation can induce, uh, can push tor cells towards the senescent cell fate, and also pathogen associated molecular pattern proteins, uh, which Laura will talk about. So, there are several transcription factor cascades that can result in a cell's acquiring the senescent uh, phenotype. Uh, these can involve P16, P53, P27, and others. Not necessarily all of these transcription factors need to be engaged. So not every senescent cell necessarily is high P16 or high P21. Some, but not all senescent cells, anywhere from 30 to 70% of most senescent cell types can acquire a senescence associated secretory phenotype or SASP, I'll call it. Uh, this is associated with increased protein production and increased mTOR. And the SASP can involve production of proteins, peptides, but also reactive metabolites and non-coding uh, nucleotides, um, things like microRNAs and mitochondrial DNA and uh, reactive metabolites and bioactive lipids, things like ceramides, uh, bradykines, um, prostaglandins, as well as inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. It tends to be those senescent cells that have a SASP that can contribute to tissue dysfunction. Um, through production of proteases, cytokines, and uh, uh, chemokines. 
Uh, the SAS can also result in uh, immune cells being attracted, anchored, and activated. Senescent cells are remarkably resistant to dying, despite the fact that those senescent cells with a SAS kill cells around them, senescent cells themselves are protected. So senescent cells can accumulate with uh, natural aging. Uh, they tend to occur fairly late in humans. There can be an exponential increase in certain tissues somewhere in the 60s to 80s, uh, quite variable among subjects. And it more depends on whether a person is frail and sick, whether they have senescent cell accumulation than just uh, chronological age alone. Here though, we're showing um, uh, adipose tissue senescence in relatively healthy subjects. We know they're healthy because they're kidney transplant donors. And we compare older to younger kidney transplant donors, and we see that there's an increase in senescent cell burden in adipose tissue and other tissues in these people in general, but there's a lot of variability. Senescence can occur at any point from uh, conception on. It occurs across the vertebrates. Uh, senescent cells appear during fetal development to help shape the fetus. They occur in the placenta, and products from them help push the baby through the birth canal. They appear at sites of wound healing, um, and they can also act as a, their, their development can act as a defense against cancer because cancerous mutations or oncogenes can make a cell become senescent, therefore exit the replicative cycle, uh, and also produce factors that kill uh, potentially cancerous cells around them. But senescent cells can also accumulate and persist. Uh, they're normally removed by the immune system, but um, where they're not, where there's a constant drive to senescence, for example, in obesity and diabetes, senescent cells can accumulate even in children and younger people. So the woman on the right has senescent cells as evident by senescent beta galactosidase staining, which is neither completely sensitive or specific, I'll caution, for senescence. But senescent cells tend to appear around blood vessels and adipose tissue. They tend to be uh, endothelial cells, parasites, and preadipocytes. In a slightly older but non-obese, non-diabetic woman, you don't see this accumulation of senescent cells. If we transplant very small numbers of senescent cells into younger mice, um, such that only one in 10,000 cells in the transplanted mouse is a transplanted senescent cell, that is sufficient to drive frailty and um, after a lag period, cause earlier death than in mice that are transplanted with non-senescent cells. So these mice uh, with a small number of, trans of transplanted senescent cells, one million trans senescent cells transplanted into the mouse, uh, results in decreased gait speed on a treadmill, decreased hanging endurance, decreased growth strength, and earlier death. However, if we transplant 500,000 senescent cells into those mice, uh, nothing happens. So there appears to be a threshold above which senescent cell burden can cause problems. And these animals that die early, um, middle-aged animals that are transplanted with senescent cells that die early, they die early of all the diseases that mice normally die from. So senescence predisposes not to just one disorder, but most of the conditions associated with aging in mice. Uh, senescence can spread from cell to cell. So if we transplant labeled senescent cells so that we know which are the transplanted cells versus the recipient's own cells, uh, we find the recipient's own cells start becoming senescent. So if we transplant senescent cells into the perineum of middle-aged mice, uh, the senescent cells tend to stay there. Uh, we can track them because they're labeled. While we begin to see senescent cells in the arms and legs of those mice, uh, because there's a spread of senescence not only in a paracrine, but also in endocrine manner through the SAS. An important paper by Ned Sharpless in 2004 in Journal of Clinical Investigation, he's now head of the National Cancer Institute, um, linked uh, senescent cell accumulation with decreased health span and showed that caloric restriction, which extends health span and lifespan in mice, is associated with a delay in senescent cell accumulation. So this led us back in 2004 to ask if senescence isn't just associated with health span, but whether senescent cells may cause decreases in health span. So we tried to begin to make um, drugs that would selectively kill senescent cells, senolytic uh, drugs, back in 2004. We had a lot of false starts. We worked with Jack Murphy in Boston and others to try to create fusion proteins 
that would bind on one end to a senescent cell and carry a toxic cargo and all kinds of other approaches. But then it finally hit us in May 2013 that senescent cells are killing cells around them, yet they themselves survive. That implied to us there must be pro um, survival pathways, anti apoptotic defenses that senescent cells have. And also we reason that senescent cells are something like B lymphoma and, lymph and lymphocytic leukemia cells that kill cells around them, yet themselves survive, uh, and that depend on uh, anti apoptotic networks for their survival. So we use bioinformatics approaches based on proteomic profiles of senescent versus non-senescent cells and asked whether there, were there was upregulation of pro-survival pathways that we call SCAPs or senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. We originally found there are five of them. Now it's known there are nine. They interact together in a network. And if you target nodes on this network of anti-apoptotic pathways by RNA interference, you selectively kill the 30 to 70% of senescent cells that have a SASP. So what we're doing is disabling these networks and we're allowing the senescent cells that are trying to kill cells around them, the ones with a SASP, to instead kill themselves, to basically commit suicide. So this leaves alone uh, the senescent cells that do not have a SASP. It kills the senescent cells that have a SASP. We found that different human senescent cell types depend on different components of this network for their survival. So human preadipocytes or fat cell progenitors depend on different pathways for their survival than senescent human endothelial cells. So senescent preadipocytes depend on uh, elements of uh, dependence receptor uh, kinases, uh, also serpene-related pathways and P21-related pathways for survival, while HUVEX <clears throat> depend on um, largely BCL2-related pathways, especially BCL extra-large but also um, some other pathways, including heat shock proteins, as Paul Robbins found. So next we used, uh, based on these RNA interference studies in the SCAT network, we used computer programs again to look for drugs or natural products that would hit those nodes on the network that I showed you in the RNA interference data. Um, we found um, quite a few things that, that would do this, around 40 um, factors that would do this. They all turned out to be what we call senolytic, selectively kill those senescent cells that have a SASP. But we focused early on on agents that we thought we could translate uh, through to people and could test in animals. So we predicted that the satinib, a SARC kinase inhibitor, would selectively kill senescent preadipocytes based on the dependence receptor networks that they depend on uh, for sur their survival. And we found that uh, desatinib, um, which has been uh, available since 2006 for treating leukemias, lymphomas, and is off used off-label for scleroderma, would kill the 30 to 70% of senescent preadipocytes that have a SAS, but would not kill Huvex. We predicted it would not kill them, senescent Huvex, because desatinib doesn't target BCL2. We uh, predicted that carcetin, a natural product, which is in apple peels, uh, flavonoid would kill senescent Huvex, but not preadipocytes because it targets the BCL2 family and certain other factors uh, related to heat shock uh, proteins and others that senescent Huvex depend on. So we found it, it did indeed kill senescent Huvex and not preadipocytes. The combination would kill both cell types. And we, along with Paul Robbins uh, and Laura Niederhofer, found that with um, certain cell types, that are killed by neither desatinib or, or carcetin, the combination would. And this indicates that these survival networks can be redundant. And therefore in some cell types, you have to hit multiple SCAT net pathways in order to kill uh, senescent cells of that particular type. I mentioned before that we found that Huvex depend on BCL2 family members. We did all of this, by the way, within a month, you know, once we, develop this hypothesis-driven approach. Nine months later, we and another group um, published that uh, another agent, Navitaclax, would uh, selectively kill human endothelial cells. We predicted it would not kill preadipocytes, and it didn't. Uh, so it's another drug which is entering uh, clinical trials. Since um, our original finding of senolytics, many others have been found using the mechanism-based approach that I mentioned. The ones in red were ones found by us with our collaborators. 
Uh, and now second uh, generation Synalytics are being developed through using high throughput screens. Paul Robbins did a lot of that work in developing some of the earliest high throughput library screens. So there are literally well over 100 Synalytic small molecule agents now that uh, we've heard about. And there are other approaches now for killing senescent cells, including CAR T approaches, uh, potentially vaccines and other, other approaches. So if we um, take adipose tissue from a, an obese diabetic human subject that has a lot of senescent cells, put that adipose tissue into explant culture uh, compared to subjects who are lean, uh, we find that a brief exposure to senolytics is sufficient to initiate the apoptosis that kills senescent cells. The apoptosis takes 18 hours but it takes only four or five hours of exposure to senolytics to kill, to initiate apoptosis irreversibly. And we find that we're able to kill these senescent cells from in these human adipose tissue explants. This is one of the better assays for senescent cells called the TAF assay, telomere associated DNA damage foci assay, but there are no completely sensitive or specific assays for senescent cells. So normally we have to combine them. If we transplant senescent cells into mice, as I showed you before, and they're light emitting, um, we are able to, uh, with the satin and carcetin administration orally to mice to kill senescent cells, whereas if we transplant light emitting non-senescent cells, those cells are not killed. If we um, irradiate the leg of a mouse uh, and then wait two months so its hair goes gray and it has trouble running on a treadmill, if we give a few doses of the combination of desatinib and carcetin orally to these mice, uh, we're able to restore their ability to run on a treadmill, and that remains throughout the remainder of their lives because there's no further impetus for new senescent cells to be formed. There's only one dose of radiation that's been given. Um, those animals that I showed you before where we transplanted senescent cells, if we treat them with a short course of senolytics, we're able to uh, reduce their frailty and restore their function back to uh, what the function is like in non-senescent cell transplanted animals. Uh, we work with Stefan Tullius, who's chief of um, transplant surgery at Harvard, to transplant hearts from old to young mice or young to young mice. We found that the hearts transplanted from old mice did not function well. And furthermore, those, the senescent cells in those hearts trans, uh, it resulted in spread of senescence to the younger animals' organs, you know, that I showed you before, the SASP can spread um, senescence. So this happens with organ transplantation. If we treat the organs before transplantation with senolytics, the hearts from old mice though, we're able to uh, prevent this early death uh, compared to when we transplant hearts from old mice to young mice versus young mice to young mice. Um, if we treat old mice with senolytics that have uh, where those mice are developing frailty, we're able to um, partially alleviate that frailty. So we're able to improve their uh, maximal speed on a treadmill, their hanging endurance, their grip strength, uh, uh, and uh, daily activity. If uh, two groups found, not us, but two groups, one group in Texas and the other at the NIH found that in most models of Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease is associated with senescent cell accumulation around the hippocampian and the frontal lobes, that um, a fairly brief course of senolytic agents given to these animals would um, uh, re kill senescent cells in the brain, uh, improve small vessel uh, perfusion, uh, result in decreased neuro, neuro, neurofibrillary tangles, and also amyloid, uh, because amyloid, uh, beta amyloid and tau can both drive senescence and be produced by senescent cells. And they also found that there was some increase in cortical and, and um, uh, uh, volume uh, after treating with senolytics, and there was risk, there was improvement in executive function and memory in these animals. Laura will talk about this in more detail, but we, uh, with Laura and um, uh, Paul and others, um, recently found that um, uh, coronavirus uh, can um, induce cells to become senescent and can upregulate ACE2 receptors in senescent cells and therefore result in increased coronavirus entry, can exacerbate the SASP of senescent cells. And Laura will talk about this, but she was able to find that um, uh, mice infected with a coronavirus related to SARS uh, 
uh, died early if they're old, uh, didn't if they're young, but if they were treated with senolytics or had senescent cells removed genetically, there was some restoration of function. So in over, as you'd predict from the geroscience hypothesis that I showed you earlier, if um, senescence is a root cause contributor to aging processes, then multiple conditions should be alleviated by this. And this in indeed appears to be the case uh, that we found our collaborators and many other groups with um, uh, senolytics that multiple conditions, uh, both even in younger animals, things like preeclampsia, for example, which is a senescence driven condition, can be alleviated with senolytic agents. So this has led to some clinical trials. Uh, the very first, one of the first ones published uh, was in patients with obesity and diabetes, like that younger woman I showed you. They had fat biopsies at day zero and day 14. Um, we gave senolytics for three days and incidentally, desatinib and carcetin have a very short elimination half-life. Uh, desatinib is four hours, uh, carcetin is 11 hours, fizetin, which I'll talk about in a moment, is three hours. So these drugs act in a hit and run fashion. It takes a week to six weeks to new senescent cells to form. So um, 11 days after the last dose of senolytics, when we re these people, we found that P16 um, and uh, SA beta gal expressing cells were decreased in their adipose tissue. There was decreased macrophage, activated macrophage infiltration and decreased fibrosis. And there was decrease, uh, decrease in a composite score of circulating SAS factors in these subjects. Another very early um, phase one open label trial looked in pulmonary fibrosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a senescence associated condition that's linked to frailty as well as lung fibrosis. Uh, a ver uh, nine doses of uh, desatinib and carcetin over a three week period in these patients led five days after the last dose to um, what looked like an improvement in six minute walk, um, gait speed, uh, chair rise, and um, short physical performance battery score. But I'd emphasize this is an open label study and there can be learning effects. So there's a double blind placebo controlled trial in this condition that's about to begin. So I don't have time to go through them all. I'll, I'm just about finished. But um, there are many clinical trials now underway with Senlytics. We're trying to do these trials through a network across the US and with international collaborators as well, including a group in Denmark where we're planning trials. Um, and groups in Holland and, and elsewhere. But um, some of the trials uh, are for frailty in elderly women with gait speed of less than 0.6 meters per second. That's using Fizetin. Again, we, these trials are in using a hit and run approach where senolytics are given for um, one to four days a month uh, because it takes time for new senescent cells to form. We're active, we're looking, we use drugs that have very short elimination half-lives. And we, so we give a high dose over a short time. Uh, this reduces side effects and off-target effects. There are three trials underway for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's a trial underway for mild cognitive impairment in collaboration with a group at Harvard. Um, there are uh, trials in um, chronic kidney disease, which are almost complete. Uh, there's um, a, a bone marrow transplant trial in younger individuals who've had high doses of radiation and chemotherapy and can get an accelerated aging light state five years after their bone marrow transplant. Uh, that trial is almost complete. That's a double blind placebo controlled trial. Um, there are trials in, um, in collaboration with St. Jude Children's Cancer Hospital looking at um, people who've had chemotherapy and radiation as children for leukemias and lymphomas. Many of them develop um, an accelerated aging-like state when they're 30 or 40. This is associated with senescent cell accumulation. They tend to develop early Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, and frailty. So that, that's a trial comparing uh, placebo to facetin uh, and uh, also to desatinib and carcetin, a three-arm trial funded by the National Cancer Institute. The trial about to begin, as I mentioned, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, double-blind. There are trials underway, uh, which is one of them's two thirds of the way through, looking at age-related osteoporosis, comparing different senolytics in a double-blind trial. There's trial underway at the Stedman Clinic funded by the Navy uh, for osteoarthritis. Uh, there are three trials for COVID uh, underway, um, one of them in nursing home, one in hospital, and one in outpatients. So in conclusion, the target of um, senolytics is senescent cells, not a single molecule or pathway. And it looks like targeting networks is more of a truly senolytic and less panolytic effect, less side effects. Uh, I didn't have time to go through it, but senolytics alleviate progenitor and stem cell function. Uh, 
they attenuate tissue inflammation and fibrosis, which Laura will talk about in more detail now. Intermittent treatment looks like it's as, if not more effective than continuous treatment because it takes time for new senescent cells to form. Uh, and it looks like senolytics delay or alleviate multiple chronic diseases and enhance health span in mice. But I caution, it's way too early for people to be taking these agents. We don't know all the downsides. There could be side effects that we don't know about. We've got clinical trials underway. Uh, they're small, they're for serious conditions because we're worried about side effects uh, and adverse effects. So we're, uh, we have to be concerned about doing trials where there's a correct risk benefit ratio. We don't want to do trials in healthy people at this point to try to prevent things that are happening. We're taking people with serious illnesses for which there's no good treatment because this is all new. So I think um, I caution anybody and from buying Senolytics uh, off amazon.com, I tell physicians not to prescribe them. Really the only place for these agents at the moment is clinical trials and I'm touching wood. I give them maybe a 50% chance of working. I, I just hope they do and I lie awake every night worried about side effects. So I'll just finish by thanking all of our collaborators, uh, the funding agencies behind us. I, I'd like to particularly thank Tamara Traconia and Izu who worked um, very early on with me in developing the first analytics. And then Paul Robbins and Laura Niederhofer are very close collaborators and Laura is going to be speaking next. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, for a very nice uh, talk. We have time for one single very quick question. Um, we have nothing in the audience. We'll take one from online. Um, what, there's a question from uh, Ron Cutler. What do old mice with senescent cells ablated die off? Um, as far as we can tell, Yuji Kenyo, who's a really good animal pathologist, is looking into that at the moment with us. It, it appears they die of the same diseases as animals normally die of, maybe a bit later, but not very much later. So we don't, we don't extend lifespan very much. What we're extending is health span. So we're rectangularizing health span curves. And very they, nice. Thanks. Okay, I think that answers the question. Thank you so much again. Let's give Jim Kirkland uh, another round of applause. Fantastic, amazing talk. Looking forward to the clinical trials.